right, hello everyone. This is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee. I have a very special guest today, uh, Kelly Hogan, who was kind enough to have me on her show a while back, and I'm, I'm very grateful that she's she's coming on to mine. Uh, Kelly, how how are you? Thanks for coming on. Hey, man. Good to see you again. Thanks for hey. having me. Yeah, you as well. Um, how have you been? I haven't talked to you in a while. Any 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 news in Kelly Hogan land? Oh, uh, food wise, same as mm -hmm. you know the last. 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> as far as in my own life, uh, our family moved to this home in the last few months. So we had a lot of changes with that. And I started a certification program recently through Dr. Ifland, Joan Ifland, um, to become a food addiction recovery advocate. So that's been taking up really? a lot of my time, but in like a really good way. Other Very than that, good. same, same. Lovely. Um, well, for, for people that don't, don't know who you are and don't know your story, can you tell us just a bit about yourself and, and how you came to, to carnivore and doing what you're doing? Yes. So I grew up in a family that was um, very much standard American. I didn't have a whole lot of childhood traumas, but I definitely did struggle with my weight. My brother and I, we ate at the same table. We, you know, my parents, it's not that they served us a lot of garbage food, but they bought into the 80s idea of fat is bad. So if anyone is getting fat, we better cut out the fat. So we ate at the same table, but my brother ended up really skinny and I ended up really not. Um, mm. And it bothered me my whole childhood. I got picked on just a little bit, nothing horrific, but enough, you know, just chubby, chubby this, chubby that. I don't want to be chubby. It really did bother me. So by the time I got to high school, um, I was gaining weight quicker, but I, I decided this is it. You can't gain weight if you don't eat. So I began, I began some really um, not cool practices. Yeah. Like if it was prom time, I would just only allow myself one little lean cuisine per day. That was it. And I could lose weight. I mean, obviously you're eating like nothing. Mm -hmm. I would drink a carnation instant breakfast per day sometimes. Like mm -hmm. that was all I would allow myself and I could lose weight. And then as soon as obviously human nature takes over, you must have food. Mm -hmm. I would gain it all back plus some. So I, I did that for a few years of high school, went off to college and they gave us this little card called the cat card. And it was our meal plan. And you could go, they had a Chick-fil-A on campus. They had um, all these buffet style dining halls and you could use, my cat card was free every year. I was on a scholarship, hmm. all you can eat. And I was studying hard and I was stressing and I was like a really good student, but I was eating all the time. And by the time I graduated, I had gained another additional 50 pounds from when hmm. I started. I was engaged at about that time, got married. And as a newlywed, I was 262 pounds. Mm -hmm. And my husband was very loving. He liked me just fine. He also had a little bit of a weight problem. Things were pretty good until then my health started bothering me. So up until then, it was all like just a weight struggle. And I've heard someone say, only the lucky ones get fat. Now, I used to be very offended by this. Like, mm -hmm. you just don't know what it's like to deal with your weight if you think you're lucky. But I get what they're saying. Sometimes health problems manifest as like autoimmune issues. And sometimes you're, you know, just heavy up until age 25, I was basically just heavy. And then I started getting boils and I thought at first it was like a hygiene thing. Am I using the wrong soaps? What's wrong with me? If no one, if you've never had a boil, um, they're very deep seated, like a giant bump, basically that gets infected. They can get staph infections in them. And I would have to go to the doctor repeatedly, many times to get them lanced, which basically means cut open and drained. And I'd go home to pack them with gauze for a couple of weeks. It was awful, man. I was getting them on my legs, my thighs, my backside. Again, I was very heavy at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I'd have to go to the doctor's office and bend over the table. It was very, not, not fun times. I was 25, 25. Yeah. Okay, so the doctor, he was a very blunt old man. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's looking at his chart. I can still see him so clearly. His name was Dr. Benjamin Dunlap. He's still alive, but I think he's around 90 now. Mm. He said, well, Miss Hogan, we're going to just keep doing this until one of us dies. <laughs> <laughs> my gosh does he think it's him or me yeah. <laughs> oh, that's not good okay and he said or you could lose 100 pounds and then I just cried 
I don't think a lot of doctors these days are probably quite that boom yeah. with their patients. I don't know, but I cried and I needed yeah. to hear that. And I said, I have tried. You don't know. I've really tried. I don't know how to lose a hundred pounds. And he said, it, you're inflamed. It's the carbohydrates. Yeah. And I was, <laughs> well, I don't even really know what that means. It was 2004. And I had heard of carbohydrates. I'd heard of Dr. Atkins, but I really didn't know what, what a carb was. So he told me, he said, for one year, I want you to eat as much meat, eggs and cheese as you want. Quote, leafy greens won't kill you. Um, no sodas. And I'll see you in a year. And I was like, or, you know, sooner than that. Cause I was coming to him a lot with yeah. these boils. One year passed not a single more boil. I walked in, I was in his office. He walked out, he looked at me, he looked at the chart. Ms. Hogan, yes. He said, what did you do? Mm. I said, I only ate the things you told me to eat for one year. And he said, no one has ever listened to me. <laughs> I, had lost eight, <laughs> I had lost 80 pounds in the first year. Wow. Nice. Yeah, and, and I literally, I, it wasn't just the weight. I really looked like a different person and yeah. I felt like a different person. Things weren't perfect for me yet because um, for five years, I did follow his advice and I did include some plants uh, in the form of leafy greens, pickles, and green beans. Not a lot. It was mostly meat, but I did include diet sodas because, you know, zero carb, Five years. This was 2004 to 2009. By 2009, I was hungry because yeah. I wasn't including a lot of fatty meats. I didn't, he didn't tell me that part. He didn't say, mm. oh, P.S. Fat's really important. He told me what I needed, but I could have used a little more information. All right, in 2009, I discovered, oh, there's a name for this. They called themselves Zero Carvers. We didn't say carnivore back then. I found this group called Zero Carb. And I just found them by searching a Google search, is it safe to only eat meat? Because I really hated vegetables and I had kind of on my own by 2009 realized I really just like the meat. Is that okay? And then this group wildly confirmed, uh, yeah, we're here. It was a pretty big community even in 2009 hmm. and they looked good. So I started asking questions. They said, so, oh, and I shared a before and after picture. They were, by this point, I had lost um, 120 pounds eating almost exclusively meat, but with diet soda. That, mm. was, that was my diet. And they said, wow, you look really good. How do you feel? I, like, I feel good. They said, how about the food cravings? It's amazing that they're gone, right? Mm. What? <laughs> Should they be gone? Cause no, yeah. I was still having tons of sugar cravings every day and they're like and you only eat meat but you still crave sugar yeah and of course then they said what else are you including in your diet I said, um diet dr pepper Ding! hello yeah. <laughs> and that's when they gave me the second piece of the puzzle you need fat and if you want to stop craving sugars you got to stop lighting up this limbic system with anything sweet yeah. So I had a really hard three days without the diet, Dr. Pepper. Then I was full on board, like, okay, no sweet taste whatsoever, no plants and all the fat I want. And that is when I really felt good. So the first five years were just practice. Yeah. <laughs> but when people ask, when did you start carnivore? I do not include those five years, even though it was <laughs> almost exclusively meat yeah. um, because I didn't feel like this. It, it was a totally different, it wasn't really carnivore to me. I didn't yeah. feel like a carnivore. Yeah. Well, but you were, you were damn close and you were at least keto anyway, you know, and, oh, yeah. um, you know, so that, that sort of, so that, I mean, so what is that? You've been, how many years would that be total now? That, 17 and a half yeah. since I first started and then well, 12 no. and a half since I really like, oh, I get yeah. it now. <laughs> I think that I think you know I use you know you you and uh, and Charles Washington as examples uh, when when you know uh, people talk about how oh no you can't you can't be you know in in a state of ketosis for that long if you're on carnivore for that long it, you, you're gonna really hurt yourself I'm like really you know because um, you know Kelly, didn't happen to Kelly Hogan you know she's fine you know Charles Washington it's just fine I'm I'm just fine and and um, you know, and, and these people that, that have problems, you know, like Dr. Saladino or Carnivore Aurelius, they were having problems after like a year or two, 
you know? And they're like, you know, it's because we wasn't e- weren't eating carbs. I was like, pretty, pretty sure 17 years trumps, you know, one and a half. And, you know, so obviously, you know, people like that are doing something different uh, than you are. And it's not carbs, you know, because you haven't had carbs. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's just a, a great uh, record in and of itself, you know, and, and just very good testament uh, proof of concept, you know? Yeah. Thanks. So I tell people, I can't prove it's my, my experience doesn't prove it's going to work for someone else, but it does mm. prove that it's possible. I yeah. mean, it's working for at least some people. It's not like I'm an anomaly. Yeah. You got Dr. Lisa Wiedemann out there. She's been yeah. doing this longer than I have. Mm. Um, Amber O'Hearn. Oh gosh. Now I'm naming names. I'm going to get in trouble. Amanda Radke. She's right yeah. up there with me as far as how long. Oh, we have not mentioned the queen. Dana Spencer shoot. Oh yeah. She was there when I first came to that website. She mm-hmm. and Charles Washington, they just been preaching it this whole time, living it the whole time. And they look fantastic. Yeah. Oh, the Andersons, yeah. uh, Joe and Charlene Anderson. I know they're really private, but they're still doing their thing. I talk to them sometimes and they're, they're thriving. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then, and they've, you know, had, had carnivore kids. You've had carnivore kids as yes. well. You know, and, yes. um, you know, and, and I mean, that, that right there, I mean, you, you can't, you can't bring a human life into this world uh, healthily if they don't have everything that they need to survive and thrive. You know, it just doesn't happen. They don't develop. And, you know, we do see a higher rate of miscarriage uh, and birth defects in, in vegan and vegetarian uh, cohorts, you know, for a number of reasons, I'd say, uh, but, you know, not getting enough uh, nutrients and also bringing in plant toxins, you know, you're not, you're not doing, you know, favors to that kid. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, we're not having those problems when people are carnivore and, and, uh, and having kids as well. So that's the right there. You know, people say, you know, I love it when they say, it's just like, you know, uh, I've seen, you know, Lane Norton, um, who is quite, you know, he's, he's quite, you know, vitriolic. And I, I really don't, uh, think that that's a very good, way to behave uh, when people are trying to you know, bring up different points of view. But, um, you know, so, someone mentioned something, was talking on one of his threads and, and they were, you know, a clinical psychotherapist and with like 20 years of experience and talking about this, oh, this research and these publications, blah, 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 blah. And I've seen this in my practice and all these people getting these benefits. And, he, and his only response was F your anecdotes. You know, he didn't say just F, you yeah. know, and um First of all, they weren't anecdotes. I mean, she was quoting studies, and um, and uh, also, you know, it's just like, okay, well, it's anecdotal. I guess it just never happened then. You know, I guess that didn't reverse their uh, you know, their psychiatric condition. You know, I guess this person that had you know rheumatoid arthritis and now doesn't, and you know, came off all of their medication. Well, that's just anecdotal. Yeah, I guess it just didn't happen then. I guess it, it, it's it's not real. It doesn't count then. You know, I mean, anecdotes. Like, we are humans. Hmm. My anecdote is a real story of a That's real it. life that went from misery at age 25 hmm. to feeling fantastic at age 43. That's yeah. that's anecdotal, but it's also my entire life experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's just like, I mean, I you can you can show me all the studies that you want, but all I really care about is is what effect it has on me. You know. I just, you know, I don't care. You, you can have a study that says I'm going to be healthy and happy and vibrant doing X and I'm, I'll be horrible and miserable and die of cancer, you know, doing Y. But if I feel better on Y and everything works better on Y, I, I, I think that I don't really care what your study says, you know? Yeah, and, especially if it was done on rats or on people who were also consuming processed carbohydrates. Yeah. Then or, yeah. Or it's just, invalid. You know, yeah, or, or just, you know, poorly designed studies, you know, there's yes. a lot of junk out there. And, yeah. you know, this is coming from a doctor, the medical literature is mostly garbage. It is just mostly garbage. It is, it is junk science, a lot of it, not all of it, a lot, yeah. some of it's very, very good. But a lot of it is junk, because it's just publish, 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 publish. And so if you want to go anywhere, advance in your in your uh, field, or, or even as a medical student, or even to get into medical school, people are, are, are publishing and trying to get uh, publications and then out of medical school to try to get into different training programs. You just have to, you have to be on, on, on top of you know, so many public publications <clears throat> that we're just, we're just pumping out garbage, you know, because it's not about, it's not about publishing quality research. It's just about having publications attached to your CV and it's just nonsense. So you get, <clears throat> we got these 10 people, ate tomato soup and these 10 people ate onion soup. And there was a 6%, you 
you know, reduction, you know, uh, in cancer from the onion soup group. And it's like, okay, well you can publish that, but it really doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And that, and that's, that's a lot of this. It's a lot of the stuff that we see. And so, yeah, you know, you, you can have a study that says anything, um, but who cares? You know, it's, it's the quality of the study that matters. And, and, uh, and that's, and that's the main thing. And, and at the end of the day, you know, if you're, if you're experiencing it and you're experiencing something different than what the study says, you know, that, that trumps that every time, you know? Yes. No study. It matters as much to someone as how they wake up feeling every day. Yeah, exactly. You know? Um, So I remember when, when we spoke last time, you mentioned that, that you, uh, when you, when you first started this, obviously, you you know, you're feeling better, you're having better health, but it actually took a while uh, for the weight to start, start coming off. Um, Can you tell us a bit more about that? You said it took like six months and you you were sort of stalled. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So we've got two real start dates here. This is hang with me. First start date was 2004. I lost weight really quickly because I went from low fat, sugary standard American diet Mm. to now basically carnivore. So when people go from eating all the things to eating meat, most people lose weight very quickly. I mean, the general, I've worked with enough people for enough years. I can say that with, with no hesitation. Most people lose weight when they cut out the carbs. And I did too. In 2009, when I started like all in carnivore, I had really gotten to where I was restricting some calories towards the end. I was, I told you I was hungry. I was eating meat, but not enough fat. So my body was getting meat, but not as much as it really needed. And so then the carnivore said, okay, cut out that diet soda and eat some fatty ribeye. And boy, did I, I finally gave myself permission to just eat. And it was taking about three pounds of meat per day to stay full. I was hungry. I was not even terribly active. Well, I wasn't active at all at that point, except I was teaching and that's, you know, not sedentary, but I wasn't exercising. And I did slowly gain about 23 pounds over the course of six months. And I can tell you, man, that was a head game. I was eating nothing but beef, no other meats and drinking nothing but plain water, not even seltzer water, not coffee, nothing no seasonings whatsoever, because back in 2009, zero carb meant you don't use seasonings, not even salt. They oh, were hardcore, not yeah. even salt. It's what most love. carnivores did. Yeah, it, that, that part has changed a lot over the years, but there are still some of the long time ago carnivores who are still going with no salt whatsoever. Yeah, it's a thing. All right. I do use salt now, by the way. But <laughs> in those days, I fell in line with my new tribe. And unseasoned beef and water, yes, I gained weight for about six months. And I stuck with it, even though every single day I would step on the scale and I was like, oh my gosh, it's gone up again. And I would tell my husband sometimes, like, my clothes are fitting tighter. He's like, honey, I'm not trying to be rude. And he's like the (laughs) least rude guy ever. You are eating, what, three pounds of meat per day? Yes. He said, are you... (laughs) <laughs> well, in my head, I still wasn't sure if this was a problem, yeah. you know, like I, this was feeling like a problem. I mm. was actually very nervous about it. The scale is going up. I, I had a lot of baggage in regard to weight. I know 23 pounds to some people might seem like, yeah, not that it was not muscle. I was not lifting weights. I literally was gaining some weight for a while. Yeah. And I, I do see it happen sometimes, especially if someone has been restricting if they come from a whole lot of fasting, a lot of calorie restriction, if they have been malnourished, even if they were eating, if it wasn't proper foods, when their body gets a hold of real food, sometimes bodies will just hang on to it for a while. But again, it's not normally your you know, obese person eating a standard American diet that gains, but it can happen. Mm-hmm. I, have, I have seen it many times, but temp- very temporary. So at the end of that six months, it's not like I suddenly said, well, now I'm going to cut back on meat. I didn't change anything. I just kept right on eating, but something inside of me did change. Yeah. And it sounds like some mystical thing, but honestly, I feel like my body was just actually fed. I didn't yeah. feel completely ravenous all the time. I could eat a pound or two of meat and feel satisfied. And I was like, oh, so that's what this feels like. I haven't really had this my whole life. I feel 
fed and and the weight did come off and then i immediately got pregnant so oh, wow. <laughs> the yeah. reason yeah really at about the um seven month mark eight months uh, i got pregnant which was one of the main reasons i started this in the first place yeah. i really the reason in 2009 was i i wasn't feeling good i was mm. exhausted i was feeling hungry and I wanted to only eat meat, but I wasn't sure if it was exactly right because I, my, my period had stopped and I wanted kids. And so that's when they're like, if you want your hormones right, you got to eat, girl, and it's got to have fat on it. And yeah. that's really, that was the point when weight was frustrating. And I do still see this with some people, not the norm, but when it happens, I try to encourage them, look, if your body is hungry for plain meat, you're hungry. You need it. You're healing something. There's yeah. something going on and I think you should feed it. And, and I understand it's a scary mental game at that point to watch the scale creep up, but I just, you know, focus on the things that are feeling better. If something is feeling good and I was, I was feeling really good. I thought, okay, this whole weight thing that that's not fun, but I do feel good. And the meat was so delicious. Mm -hmm. I just stuck with it. I went with it. Yeah. Well, and it worked. And then, and then, so once, once you hit that switch, did the, did the weight come off fairly rapidly after that? Very yeah. quickly. Yes. Yeah. It took about six months to gain it and about six months to lose it. No, yeah. six weeks, six weeks, six yeah. months to gain 23 pounds and about six weeks to lose it. And again, yes. I did not, I didn't change what meats I was eating. I didn't have any eating windows. I didn't put any new rules. I was still doing the same thing, mm -hmm. but I felt different in my hunger. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, panic eating. I had really yeah. been like panic eating for six months. I was so hungry. Yeah. And then, and then you just naturally wanted less. Is that right? I did. And it's not yeah. like it was a lot less, but I felt I could feel satiety. So my guess is I'd never at that point heard the phrase leptin resistance or leptin sensitivity, mm -hmm. but I really think I did become leptin sensitive over the course of that six months by really feeding myself you know when we ignore our hunger and satiety signals for years on end through crazy yo-yo dieting and then binges your brain stops hearing the leptin that's in your body and i'm sure i had plenty of it because i you know if you've got any body fat you've got some leptin in there mm -hmm. but my brain it wasn't registering and then at some point i think it, it just started to click so that a pound of meat felt nourishing and i felt good and then yeah. I could go several hours. But the carnivores kept saying, if you eat a big meal of fatty meat, you should be able to go several hours without food. I'm like, but what if I can't? I didn't feel like I could. I mean, I would be so full. And then an hour or so later, I would feel hungry again. And I thought, yeah. what's wrong with me? And I do see this in my coaching too. It happens that sometimes people can't feel full, even on fatty meat. And if you've never experienced it, it's hard to get like, really? Cause I find fatty meat very satisfying. I do too. Now I do too. I can go easily 18 hours and not feel hunger. And then, you know, the next day I'm ravenous, but back in those days, I feel for them. If you have no leptin sensitivity, it can take a while of steadily getting proper nutrition meat. And then you will start to feel your leptin and, and can feel satisfied. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know that, that's a very good point, you know, because there there are a lot of processes in our body that happen every day that you know if you ignore them long enough, you have areas in your brain that are responsible just for shutting down those signals, and because you you, you don't need alarm bells going off all the time, all the time, all the time, because it's just it's too distracting. Um, you know, think about it like you know if you you really need to pee and you just you need to pee. And then you just, but you, but you can't, you're in the car, you're in somewhere and it's just not going to happen. And eventually that sort of ebbs off. Well, uh -huh. you didn't, you, you don't need to pee any less. That stretch <laughs> is still the same on your bladder. It's just the signal just to get like, okay, well, we can't, we can't deal with this right now. So I'll stop bugging you. And, uh, and that's what it is. Um, we, we have that for thirst and we have that for hunger. We have that for a lot of different, different processes and you know even pain if you're if you're you know this is why you know like animals uh in the wild you know they'll have their leg ripped off or they'll be attacked by something and they'll have you know parts of them hanging off and they're and they're just walking you know they're not just sitting mm -hmm. there screaming uh because they're just like i can't deal with this right now i just escaped you know a lion and i need to get the hell out of here 
or on, or on lunch. And they're probably going to be lunch anyway, because you're not going to heal from some of these injuries, but, but they just do that. Whereas, you know, sometimes we will have a, a minor injury and, but we're so fixated on it because we don't, we're not running from a wolf, you know? So we've got, we can fixate on it. You know, you actually do experience that more. And uh, there's a, there's, there's a pain gate theory of, of, um, of injury where if you focus on it, you go like, oh my God, you will actually increase that signal of pain up to your brain. And we can actually measure the signal that goes up uh, nerves for pain. We can actually measure pain. There's a, there's a unit for pain. And, um, and this, you can measure these things. And when you go like, yeah, I can't deal with this right now. And you just make, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, you have natural endorphins that hit on these receptors, your actual opioid receptors. That's what, what like opioids work on these receptors to dull pain. And you naturally will dull pain and you will get a lower signal of pain up to you. So be like, yep, yeah, can't deal with that right now. You will actually experience less pain. So we have a lot of these, these processes in our body. And, you know, it's, it's no surprise that, you know, after a while uh, of, of, of ignoring your hunger signals, um, you know, that, that you'll become insensitive to them. So that, that yeah. makes, that makes perfect sense. And, and, uh, and that's a perfect, uh, you know, explanation of, of, of what goes on. I, I mean, it, it, it fits the, the observed, uh, uh, facts anyway, you know? Yeah. And same for people who binged because I was also at times in my life, I would be overwhelmed. And so binge eating, you were obviously eating past the point of where your body says, Oh, you're full. Yeah. Nope. We're going to power through that. If you do that repeatedly enough, again, you stop yeah. getting that signal. I had never thought about it. Like the having to pee in the car though, mm. that that's a good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, um, you were talking about, you know, obviously you, you've had, um, oh, sorry, you've had, uh, how, how many kids now have you had since, since going carnivore? Three, three. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, what, what are their ages? I have an 11 year old daughter, a nine year old mm -hmm. son and a newly six year old daughter. Oh, very she cute. just, my girls both just had birthdays. Oh, very sweet. That's yes. good. So, you know, um, how, how are they, you know, I mean, cause they, they, they've lived their whole life like this, you know, did you, did you, you know, start them off on meat? Did you try giving them, you know, baby food and formula or, or what did, what did you do when you were raising your kids? Okay. So earlier when you said I've had three carnivore babies, I've had three mm -hmm. carnivore pregnancies. They right. are not completely carnivore now. So mm -hmm. here's how we started off though. My main goal for them was to get them to have a really good taste and appreciation for meat. So that was the only food they had when they were first getting their teeth. With my first daughter, I was a brand new mom and I didn't know about baby led weaning, baby led weaning. So I was pureeing roasts and pouring fat into all these little glass jars. And it was such a great way for her to start. And it was also exhausting. It took so much work just constantly making baby food. And then when my second, when my second one was born, my oldest daughter was only one. So I had to, I was like, oh my gosh, here I am with this she couldn't even walk and I've got, well, when I was pregnant, she couldn't even walk. And now I'm going to be making baby food and somebody, it was a carnivore. Her name is Margot. She said, why don't you just do baby led weaning? That's what we did. I don't know. What is that? She said, as soon as they can pick up food, which, you know, at five to six months, they can grab something big. And as soon as they can get it to their mouth, let them Mm. Like, do they not choke? They don't even have teeth. She's like, no, just throw a chicken leg or some ribs, a strip of steak. I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> but so of course I turned to, I mean, it's, I trusted her enough to look into it. It turns out it's a thing. If a baby can get a strip of steak, not tiny bits, cause tiny bits they can throw in and actually choke. Mm. But um, if they can get a chicken leg, a rib with some meat on it to just gnaw on with gum on, they're basically gumming it. They might have one or two teeth by six months. Then you can actually see that they're getting nutrition. When you change their diaper, you're like, yep, something is definitely different. <laughs> this is not just a, a breast milk diaper. So yeah. I nursed them for the first, I blushed a little on that one. <laughs> <laughs> pretty talk right there. Okay, so I nursed them for the first um, until they could pick up some food. And I continued actually nursing because at six months, they're not getting a lot. They're mostly sucking on strips of steak and gumming on some ribs, but they loved it. 
And that I think is key. So many times the first baby food people go for is like a can of pureed bananas and it's just pure sugar. And if you start kids off on fruit, 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 and then you say, you know what? And I have so many mom friends who will say, how do your kids eat meat? My kids won't even taste it. I think it's a texture thing. I'm like, yeah, it's because their first several months of life, all they had was maybe hopefully breast milk, maybe formula, which formula, one of the primary ingredients in a lot of the brands is corn syrup. Mm-hmm. Not good. And then yeah. the pureed foods come out. It's not meat. Oh, except when it is, it is not good. <laughs> Dr. Chafee, have you ever tasted baby food meat? Oh, no. no. Oh, do sense. not. It, oh. It, there is no, no semblance to me. Oh. The smell when you open it is like cat food. Oh. It is disgusting. And I'm thinking... No wonder babies won't eat meat. That's yeah. not even, what is that? It's so yeah. gross. And I tried them because, you know, I thought this would be easier. I'll give my baby pre-made baby food meat. Yeah. No, I couldn't even get it near my face. So that's why I was pureeing for a while. And then baby led weaning, they develop taste for meat at their one year birthday. Instead of letting them mm-hmm. taste cake, I did let them taste squash or some pureed green beans. Like they didn't really like it, but I Good. didn't care. My goal Good. for them was not, I am going to make mm. them never taste anything else. I wanted mm. to keep out sweet tastes, have them love the taste of meat and then let them decide on some things. I'm not paying for grains. I'm not paying for sugar. That That's, yeah. I'm not doing that. But if they yeah. want to have some sweet potatoes sometimes, I let them have sweet potatoes sometimes. Yeah. So that's where yeah. we are. Yeah. I, I made that face there on the squash because I've, I've never hated anything more than I hate squash. Oh, and like, really? it was just like, Oh, it's just the worst. It was so gross. And, um, my, I remember we, when I was, uh, I don't know, maybe like 11 or 12 or something like that. We, my mom made some like acorn squash and my, you know, my father, same, th- same idea, you know, just very much wanted to keep fat out of the house, you know, because I was just big, big thing. And my dad had read the, the Pritikin book about, you know, how to you know stave off heart disease. And, you know, it was really, most of it was, was staying away from processed food and sugar, but he also said, and stay away from fat. And so that's what most people focused on was the fat part of that. But in fact, it was, there was a lot more to it. And so we had, we had this acorn squash and my mom sort of roasted in the oven. And I was just looking at that. I'm like, that does not look appealing. And you know, I always would just, I would always eat the meat and, and, and then I would suffer the rest of it if I had to. And, and this time I just, I just couldn't do it. It was so bad. And I I remember taking a bite of it and it was, it was just disgusting. I was actually revolted by this. And, um, I just, I just couldn't do it. I had a couple bites. I was like, no, that that's just gross. Like I won't do it. My dad just was not happy with that. He was, uh, he, he thought that this was being rude to my mom and, you know, she cooked this, you know, nice dinner for us and it was being rude not, not to eat it. No one else ate this crap. I don't know why he focused on me. Maybe I just, you know, made a, made a bit of a fuss. And, and so he, the laser was on me, but like no one else in my family, it is, they had a couple of bites and it was just like, Oh, yeah. okay. mm, you know, and like, but for some reason he focused on me, he's like, you are going to eat that and you're going to finish this. And I was just like, I can't. This is yeah. awful. And that, that you know, pissed him off more. And so he was just sat with me and he was just like, you know, you're going to finish this thing. And so I was like, you know, like, it's like sobbing and like eating this stuff. And like every bite that I took, it was just like, it, I worked it up to make myself even more re- revolted by this every bite. And so like, I had a, like a tall glass, like a 12 ounce glass of milk. And I would just like, I'll just like drink it down like a pill. I'd take a bite and I'd, go, oh, and I'd drink it down and I'd just drink that. And I just do like catch my brother. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just kept doing this and yes. um, I kept, kept sort of taking bite after bite after bite. And like, I, I just, I just must've filled up like a, like a pitcher of milk oh. because I remember, I just, I remember like leaning over for another one. I just went and just milk just poured out of my mouth. I, it didn't, I didn't feel oh. like I was vomiting. Like I was like convulsing my stomach or yes. anything like that. It, I was just full and it just, it just poured out and like it poured out into the, into, into the squash my dad was just like, damn it and like just got up like that was the end of that and like you know all my the rest of my siblings and my mom were sort of hanging around the corner just like watching me like oh this is bad and you know my mom came up to me afterwards and she was just like 
She's like, yeah, that was, it wasn't really that good, was it? And I was just like, <laughs> no, it was terrible. She's like, you know, we, we used to like that when I was a kid, but you know, we, we used to we used to put it in the oven and put a lot of brown sugar and melt that on and caramelize it and put a bunch of butter. I'm like, that that would have been better. Yes, yes. you know, <laughs> and um, you know, like this was just not terrible. And so yeah, I've just I've always hated squash, and so it's just well, like. Oh. none of my three will eat it now and i don't Good. even remember what squash tastes like but after that story bad. i mm -mm, never want to know <laughs> it's really really bad like, oh. one time i missed going to the fair because i could not choke down this succotash which is like a tomato and okra mush and my mm. parents were like if you want to go to the fair you'll eat it oh. and i remember crying <laughs> i literally can't i can't yeah. do it so i i didn't get to go my oh. kids are so so lucky i have never once ever said you yeah. better eat your vegetables in fact i'm through i don't care i literally don't care and i'm happier if they don't yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah and um uh what was i gonna say yeah like um i had a, a friend of mine and she she's doing uh, she's raising her kids you know in that same way and um and uh you know she she's only only sort of fed them meat and only had them have meat and that and that's all they want and she says she's never had a problem feeding them she's never had a problem with them you know being picky with their food they've always been excited to have their food like slapping the table and getting excited their eyes are going and they get really excited and and people that go over for dinner and they see her daughter when she was you know six months old slapping the table like that they're like whoa she's getting really excited and she's like yep she she likes her meat and, um, you know, I mean, that, that says something, you know, these kids are, they're closer to their genetics than, than, than we are. They haven't been, you know, uh, conditioned to, to like. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, so now she has two kids. Uh, she's got a girl and a boy. They've both just been eating meat. They're both, you know, doing very, very, very well. And they both love the love the meat. And like, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, one of those things that you know people talk about all the time is like their, their kids are such fussy eaters they're such picky yes. eaters they have such a hard time and uh you know they won't eat this there was a video i just saw some some monster like force feeding avocado mashed avocado to this infant and and the baby was like gagging going Ugh! yeah Ugh! you know and like and she's just like she's like yeah get out and, and the video was called huh. avocado one child zero i was like you're a monster you know, like, oh, and, um, you know, it's just like, so even avocado, which, you know, most, most adults would say like, oh, that's a pleasant taste. You know, the, the kid is, is more sensitive to that. It's saying it's like, well, there's something bad in here, like really shouldn't be doing this. And, you know, I, so I don't think it's a p being picky eater. I think that they are, wow. they're recognizing that this is not food and this is not good for them. And that, you know, maybe you, you, as the parent should be a little smarter than your infant child, you know? and uh, and not and not you know poison them you know yes i think there's really two things at play for one thing i think kids are so uh, aware of, of toxins they haven't been indoctrinated with this idea of kale is healthy yet and they know no it's not it's disgusting so they i do think pick up on that also i heard dr iflin say the other day picky eaters and my I have a lot of friends whose kids are in fact picky eaters and the moms say they eat almost nothing. If it's not a chicken nugget or macaroni and cheese, yeah. they will not eat. And they eat almost nothing. Okay, Dr. Iflin said, calling processed food addiction, which is what she says these kids also have, they are addicted to the processed food. Calling them picky eaters is like calling an alcoholic a picky drinker. She's yeah. like, it's not that they're picky, they're literally addicted to a very highly addictive substance. Yeah. And so they won't go back to these, to even some kids won't go to even a beautiful, delicious ribeye. I've seen kids turn it down and I'm like, what's happening? My kids love, love their food. They eat like linebackers. I mean, they're killing <laughs> me here, man. They eat so much. Yeah. Uh, they really do. They have huge nice. appetites and they all three love the taste of steak. They like it very rare. Do not give them a brown burger on the inside either. They really like their meat, medium rare to rare. And, and so, but I thought that was, that was a really interesting take on it, right? Alcoholics are not picky yeah. drinkers, they're addicts. Yeah. So yeah. you got to get that junk out of these kids systems so they can really taste food for and get nutrition. Yeah. 
you know, well, that's what they do with, with uh, dogs and cats. You know, if they don't, if you change food and they don't really like the food, you know, the thing is like, well, you know, they're going to get hungry eventually, you know, just, yes. you know, just leave it there. And I, you know, it's, it sounds, it sounds a bit harsh, but you know, you need to do something when you're, when your kid is only eating processed garbage and is harming themselves from that. It's not a small difference. You know, it, it's, it's a very, very big difference. And, you know, it, it can be difficult, you know, that, you know, saying this, oh, well, they, you know, they're really fighting against it and they really don't want it and fine, but, you know, eventually they're going to want to eat and, you know, like you just, you just need to be able to, to wait them out. Um, when they get older, obviously, you know, they can, they can go out and, and buy their own food or get something, but you don't have to let it in your house and you don't have to, you don't have to uh, you know, you know, buy it and, and, uh, uh, enable them. Uh, you just to be like, all right, look, you want to, you want to eat something when we go outside of the house with your own money, that's your business. But you know, in this house, this is, this is what we, eat, you know, and, uh, it's, it'll suck at first and there's going to be, uh, some teething issues. And you know, obviously everyone's situations at home is very different. And sometimes that's just not logistically possible due to, you know, uh, difficulties in, in a relationship, uh, between parent and child, but, you know, by and large, you know, you, you should be able to slowly incrementally change things around and, and, and bring them around. And certainly with younger kids, it's, um, you know, you, you, you just control what comes in or out of the house. And, you know, if there's a, I don't want this, you may be like, well, you know, I guess you're not eating today. You know, that's what we're having. I've, I've had many meals that at my house growing up that I did not want, you know, but it's just like, well, you know, I'm hungry I want to eat something. You know, so I'll make yeah. the best out of it. You know, That's right? Yes. Yeah. But the good thing is, and I know it's a lot harder if your kid is already very addicted to processed foods. Mm. But if somebody is, because I get a lot of messages saying, "I'm pregnant, um, yay! How am I going to feed my kid?" You know, the good news is if Me they too. don't start off on the processed foods, yeah. the um, the main things I would really look to avoid, obviously, added sugars and anything with a paragraph. If the ingredients include a paragraph. And you don't know what they are. If you can't legitimately say, oh, I've seen that product before. I put that in my mouth by the spoonful. Like, why would we do it? And most of the ingredients never. We don't have a clue what they are in these processed frozen junk foods. Food dies. I would encourage people, especially if you are just getting started with your kids, either changing diet or you're just now having kids, look into food dies and how it affects mental um, issues for kids and adults, frankly, mm -hmm. but I think kids are even more triggered by it. Dude, I had this beautiful little meat-based 18-month-old, Julia. That's my oldest. She was a, I mean, she's just darling, still is, yeah. but at 18 months, you've never seen more of a little cherub, okay? Yeah. And I took her to the doctor because I can't even remember now, but I feel like she'd either gotten an ear infection or a chest cold or something. I mean, this was first time mom. And she's like, the doctor said, we have to put on antibiotics. Oh, okay. Okay. And I go and I pick it up and the medicine is pink because that's what they do to children's medicine. No one has yet explained, except that it's more appealing to children. And that drives me crazy. But I, I give the first dose to her within an hour. My darling baby girl is swinging punches, screaming in the floor, tantruming. I called her, wow. the pediatrician, Dr. Shops. I said, I don't know what's happening right now, but I feel like she's reacting to this antibiotic. She's like, yeah. yes, honey, it has red dye in it. And it's very common for kids to have reactions. Why are we giving them red dye then? This was my first experience with hearing like, okay, Then why did you so give that to my child, you monster? Why, yeah, why are we and doing didn't this tell to me. all babies? Right. So I said, can we get it not red? There are literally some antibiotics yeah. that they cannot get for children, at least at Walgreens. That's where I've normally gone. I've tried CVS. They'll say it does not come in anything other than pink. So I had it put on her medical records, allergic to red dye. That one, thank goodness, the doctor was really good. She called in a whole new different antibiotic in clear or white or something. But yes, and, and I have taught public school, I'm not now currently teaching, for 20 years. And they kick off public school morning breakfast with colorful, brightly colored cereal bars filled with sugar, you know, like tricks, fruity pebbles that are glued together with sugar goo, 
hand them this brightly colored mask and then say, go have a good day. Their, their brains are on fire. And it's obvious from watching some of these kids that they're, they're not like they're trying to be bad. They literally can't control their emotions. They, they're struggling mentally. And it killed me. I had breakfast duty for like a decade. So here I was just watching. There's no eggs. There's no meat. It's just colorful sugar bars filled with dye. Breaks my heart. Why do we do this to our babies? Yeah. Just give them some meat. Yeah. So, yeah. so what do you do for, uh, do, you, do you send school lunches with your kids or how do they navigate school? Every day. They've yeah. never bought a school lunch. I yeah. mean, there's, there's nothing there for them. Every once no. in a while, they might serve a burger patty, which has even who knows what in it with bread and French fries. It's just garbage. I'm sorry. Mm. If there are it children is. starving and I know they give out free food for kids, great. I'm glad they're not starving to death, but I just wish it was real food and not food like substances. So every day they pack their food. They'll take either egg muffins. They've taken hard boiled eggs. Is it okay to go into what I send yeah, for lunches? Please okay. Do. Yeah. Uh, deli meats roll like meat and cheese roll ups. They do eat dairy. Uh, they do seem to hear, handle dairy fine. I have to limit dairy because of like acne. Uh, I've, hold on. I wrote down a few things I send. Um, strips of steak, like fajita meats. Nice. Hot dogs. I try to buy, you know, the cleaner hot dogs. Burger patties. We call them meat cookies here. Mm -hmm. It's literally just burger patties. Pork rinds, Paleo Valley beef sticks. When I'm feeling really generous, I'll sometimes send them some carnivore crisps. But, who, you know, carnivore bars, they barely ever get to touch my carnivore bars because, yeah. number one, I love them too much, and I can't afford to do that for school lunches. But yeah. Epic Meat Bars, those mm -hmm. are from Target. Um, they are not as good as carnivore bars, mm -hmm. but they, they'll do the trick for a kid's yeah. school lunch. It's really not bad. They have, they have um, a ton of pepper, yeah. if I remember correctly. They're pretty seasoned. Yeah. So for a lot of carnivores, it's too much. It's a little much for me, but for my kids, they like seasoning and two out of three of my kids love spice. Okay. So, so they're fine with some Epic meat bars, but those are the, and, and that do allow them to have very limited, like for a dessert, dessert, a small amount of fresh fruit, a few slices of apple, something like that. So that's what their lunch looks like most days. Cool. Yeah. And you, you don't get any pushback from the teachers of the schools or anything? Oh no, they, they yeah. don't care. They have so much more to worry about. <laughs> and the only pushback I ever got, no, I doubt anyone yeah. in, now their ages has a clue what's in their lunchbox. Yeah. Um, in daycare, I did have an encounter, which I don't think I've ever talked about on air, but this lady was really nasty to me. Mm. And, and I was really taken aback and didn't know what the deal was. Like my baby was just a baby, an infant. And I had never had anything, but then she started sending notes home. I would send my little jars of pureed meats. Remember mm. that I spent so much time working on and she would put little notes on the, on the, they would send a report card home every day, like telling what your kid did. Mm. And it would say like, just meat question mark. And you're like, yeah. oh no, she didn't. Yes. So when they were babies. H exclamation yeah. point. <laughs> He said that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I did actually end up, um, we ended up switching daycares, not just because of the yeah. question on there, but there was, there was definitely a vibe. I couldn't, and I'm like, I can't keep leaving my baby here with somebody who feels like there's no relationship, mm. no trust. But ever since then, I've never had anybody get weird about their food. I think as they get yeah. older, I mean, literally a fifth grade teacher, they're just happy. Everyone is alive and not killing each other. They don't care what Julia eats. Yeah, well, that's, that's good to hear. It's um, it, it's quite intrusive here in Australia. Like they will go through your lunches, and yeah, and they will. And if there's too much meat, they'll take it away, <gasps> and they'll send them home and say like, no, you know, you can't. You have to have more fruits and vegetables. They have to have a certain number of fruits and vegetables. There are some schools that are pure vegan. You you cannot send meat in with your kid. You know, they're they're very very so. Okay. I've noticed about Australia, they, they, they're, they're quite you know, pedantic in the sense that they, they, they'll really trust the guidelines. Like, so if, if they say fat's bad for you, fat causes heart disease, they're like, right, get that the hell away from me. And, and so they do. And so, you know, the market here is such that just things are very low fat to, to the extent that the cattle have been bred to be more lean because that is just oh. the market. 
and I've spoken to butchers and I'm looking, I was like, I want your fattest cut. I want, you know, try to get your fatty as this and that. And they were like, that is so refreshing because people, this, uh, she was telling me that a lady came in, bought a ribeye loin, ribeye, mind you, uh -huh. went home and cut out all the pieces of fat, brought it back. and was like, you owe me three pounds of meat. <gasps> Oh my gosh. It was just like, it's just full of fat. He's like, yeah, don't buy ribeye then, idiot. You know, oh my and gosh, that's um, how the animal comes. It yeah. comes on the animal. Well, but you know, it's the but best it's, part. It's, it's, and it's ribeye. You don't, you that's don't crazy. want it. Get sirloin, get rump, yes. get something that's lean. It, yeah. They exist. And, yeah. uh, you know, you bought, you bought the fattiest cut and, and then you got upset that there was fat in it. Really? Really? So, yeah, I mean, but, you know, so the whole, whole plant pushing all oh, vegetables and, yeah. you know, uh, vegan is it's just the best way to go. They've really bought into this. And mm. because, you know, it is, it is quite intrusive in, in some ways, you know, I have noticed that since I've gotten here, the government's is, it's a bit more of a, of a nanny state and, you know, okay. you, you have people sort of watching you a little more here. Uh, there's yeah. traffic cameras everywhere. I have never driven the speed limit as much in my life as I have here. You know, I've, I got, well, it, it cost me about two grand in tickets until I finally was just like, right, I'm just putting on cruise control, whatever the hell that limit, that sign says. And, um, you know, because it's just, you're just always there. And, and there's, there's, there's always just someone checking over your shoulder pretty much all the time. And so, yeah, they get, they get very involved in uh the, the rearing of children and, and school lunches is one of them you know <clears throat> there's a there's a campaign out right now saying oh you shouldn't shouldn't send ham shouldn't make ham sandwiches shouldn't use lunch meat oh because they have nitrates and they have nitrites and it's just like um that's garbage you know yeah. and so you know there's way more you know uh in in celery than there are yes. in in ham and that's why they use this naturally cured they'll use celery powder yeah, that's because it has, it has nitrates in there. Nitrates, you know, yeah. and so you know, and then and then your saliva. Not many people know this, but your saliva produces more nitrates. It's like thousands of times the amount of nitrates just in your saliva right now that you are swallowing right now than in 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 a serving of processed meat. I did not know that. Yeah, so you know, it, it's a complete farce. And, you know, the studies, you know, like we said, you know, uh, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of the, the research and the studies that have come out in medicine are junk. And, and you look back at the origins of these, they're junk. You know, they looked at animal models and they gave them like something like 20 or 30,000 times the amount of nitrates and nitrites that yes. you would ever see. And they're like, oh, and there's a, there's a small increase correlation in, in, in cancer rates. It's like, Okay. And, you know, like, well, how is that that's, useful information? Right. That's you know, not actual like, meat. You know, no, yes. exactly. And you're, you're just not getting, you know, this in, in those doses. You're just not, you know, it was perfectly displayed in game changers. They tried to use this as a way of saying like, oh my God, processed meat's so bad. And that's the way they pitched it, you know, because they're con artists. Um, yes. And, uh, oh, sorry. And in, in, um, what the health, God, that was such a piece. I was so pissed. I might go through, but I wrote copious notes because someone had me, I was like, oh, you, you should, you should watch this. Oh, it might, really might change your mind. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. And I watched it and I was just furious the whole time. And I was like, it took me four hours to, to go through an hour of this movie because I kept stopping it and writing angry notes about how garbage, what they just said was yeah. with references and links to studies mm -hmm. and everything like that. I'm like, this is bullshit. And here's why. And here's a link. And like, and so I had this whole thing and I sent it to him. I'm like, you read this, you, uh, you know, you, you made me watch that. Now you have to, you know, read my, my angry you. Uh, responses. Yeah. I should probably do an episode about that. Just going through that, but do it. Um, yeah. Um, but you know, right at the beginning, you know, you know, that they're, they're um, being intentionally misleading because they said, you know, like, oh yeah, like processed meats. They're like, you know, they're, they're a class one carcinogen, just like cigarettes and plutonium okay and then they and then they actually and they know they're full of it because you you, you look over and there's a number next to that right and that's the, you know the relative risk of cancer right for each one and so lunch meat was like you know six right okay cigarettes were three hundred and fourteen thousand. 
Oh my gosh. Okay. Not the same yeah. thing. Not plutonium, 8.6 million. Right. Yeah. Just like plutonium. Yeah. Just you the know? same. Ham yeah. sandwich, just like, you know, walking through, you know, the core of a nuclear reactor, just the right. same. And um, yeah, and so it's just, and so they have this this uh, visual because visuals are very powerful of, you know, kids sitting down to breakfast, like, oh yeah. And the mom having like this, you know, ashtray with a bunch of like dirty cigarette butts and like pouring it on their plate. You know, it's just like, yeah, you're giving them, giving them processed meat. That's like feeding your kids cigarettes in the morning. I was like, uh, no, um, you know, one cigarette is like feeding your kid 30,000 slices of lunch meat maybe in animal models maybe yeah. you know but but smoking just had correlative studies as well we have no actually have no proof of causation we just have very strong correlation because it was like you know people who smoked are 20 times more likely to get cancer right so right. that's a big that's a big uh, increase but you know these things with the with the nitrates in animal models it was not close to 20 times the amount got got cancer at 30,000 times the the nitrates that you're going to get in a serving of lunch meat. So it's complete garbage. And you know and they knew it was garbage because they showed the numbers. They knew the numbers. They knew that that, that you know uh, had had you know nothing to do with anything. And then they said, "Wow, and this is a class 1 carcinogen and you know unprocessed meat, well that's like a, a class 2 carcinogen." So let me like, "Oh, it's like, okay, so what's you know what's its number 1?" Mm -hmm. You know, like so, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely nonsense. So, yeah, you make thousands of times more nitrates in your saliva than you do, uh, than you get from lunch meat. And they're, and they're trying to vilify it. So they have, they have this campaign out against ham right now in Australia. Oh, my God. You do, oh, you make a ham sandwich for your child. And like, you're going to kill him. You're going to kill him, love. You know, it's just like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you. it's just madness. They're, they're just so on the tear to, to vilify meat. And, um, and I, I just think it's, it's, it's just awful because you are malnourishing children yes. and you're giving them very, very disordered eating habits. And, and they're just, they're just going to be very unhealthy adults and they're not going to develop to their genetic potential. They're not going to be as smart. They're not going to be as athletic. They're not going to be as healthy. And this is going to last the rest of their life because once that's done, it's set in stone. Uh, and you can, you can obviously polish up uh, what you have developed into, but you're, you're not going to you develop again. You're not going to, your brain won't grow bigger. It might get more effect, effective and efficient and powerful that can do that, but it's never going to get bigger. And all those, those, those early synapses and development of your brain, it will never do that again. And so it, they cannot be done again. And, you know, I think that's just, that's just an absolute crime against humanity to keep pushing this when they when they either know that it's crap or know that it's based on very flimsy evidence yeah. yes and if you, if people haven't been around school age children particularly so i taught at a title one school which is all about poverty levels mm -hmm. but what title one equates to most in my book is they get free school breakfast mm -hmm. and free school lunch which sounds very nice Go to a Title I school and hang out for a while, and you will see what um, very addicted, brain-inflamed mm. children look like. And it's not because of their poverty level, necessarily. Some things like trauma may be a part of, I'm saying, they're being fed free garbage in large amounts on a daily basis. And it's being blamed on the fact that they're poor kids. I personally think it's because... Yeah. They are getting these dyes and sugars and processed foods in much higher amounts than other schools who have to pay for it. And, you know, it's probably just as easy to send a ham sandwich, which, you know, it's pretty great if you leave off the bread. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ham is awesome. <laughs> ham is yeah. awesome. I, um, I went on a road trip and uh, I was just sort of looking for, you know, meat that I could, I could eat. I had a cooler with ice. And, and so I, I would, I would bring meat and, you know, I cook it over like an open fire and I had, I cut up a bunch of beef cubes, um, from like ribeyes and, um, you know, salted them all and, and, I uh, just sort of left them in there to sort of marinate in the salt and they were great. And just eating them raw was great, but, you know, I'd put them on like a, you know, instead of like a, a marshmallow on a stick, like I just had chunks of meat on a stick yeah. and I would just like 
just, you know, flame grill them. And they were just amazing. And that's, so that, that's what I was eating on this camping trip. I was going sort of all up and down um, sort of the, the Northern coast of Western Australia. I did a big road trip up there for a couple of weeks and it was, it was awesome. And then I was, you know, going into town um, to sort of stock up. And I was sort of thinking like, Oh, do I want to sort of keep doing this? And I was like, well, what's, what's something that I can just sort of have around and just, you know, is it going to be good? I'm like a ham. You know, that'd be good. I just got a whole ham and uh, I think I got two. And, uh, and so I just, I just had this thing and I have a picture on my Instagram. You just like, going, just biting into this thing. It was this massive, you know, dinosaur leg. And um, yeah. And that's what I just ate. Just, just cutting off big chunks of ham. And like that, that's what I ate. It was great. And no problem with that. You no, know? me neither. Yeah. It's delicious. Um, obviously, most, most people don't do this with their kids. Um, do you find that there's, there's an issue in social settings with, with your kids and with other kids or with other parents, or, or is everyone pretty much, you know, uh, understanding of what you want to do and how you want to raise your kids? I, I think the hardest thing is when we go to birthday parties and the only thing out is a cake, a big bowl of Doritos. Mm. And, you know, there's just nothing there that I, feel comfortable with the meetings. I normally, I make this cake. It's a carnivore cake called an oopsie cake. It's a takeoff on a very old internet recipe that I found, but it's cream cheese and eggs. Heavy cream is the icing. That's it. If you want to add a little vanilla flavoring, I, I usually do for the kids. No sugar, no grains. That's it. So I will normally take um, a Tupperware container. <laughs> I always for myself, I often carry what I call purse bacon, but if we're going to a party, <laughs> <laughs> I've got first cake for the kids. And so I'll say, go get your plates up there. They'll walk up there, get their normal birthday plates. I put cake on it. That takes all of what, five seconds to put a piece of cake. They sit there eating their cake with everybody else. Honestly, at a party for kids, it's normally chaotic. And there's kids who don't eat their cake anyway, just because, you know, cake icing is very strong. And a lot of kids don't like it. It's, it has not been an issue. I'd say that's oh, probably good. the hardest part is just because now I have to make a cake to go to a birthday party and that's sort of annoying. <laughs> but yeah. it's it's not like parents go, oh my gosh, did you just pull cake out of your purse? No one has ever come in <laughs> if they notice. Yeah. I just met, I'm trying to make new friends up here in my new surroundings. Um, and I met a lady this past week and she says, I don't do any sugar or grains for my children. I was like, oh my gosh. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there are more people who are coming around to the idea that dyes and, you know, food products with paragraphs of ingredients, you know, trying to limit those things for their kids. Yeah. It, I don't find that it's all that hard to find somebody who's at least open to the idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's, I mean, I don't, I don't have kids, but, you know, I would, I would imagine that, and I, I would expect that, you know, raising them in a certain way and raising them to understand, you know, why you're doing something and then just having them have a taste for it, they're going to pretty much, you know, police themselves. It's not, they're, they're going to want to sort of eat a certain way because that's what they enjoy and that's what makes them feel good. And because you've, you've spoken to them and told them why you're doing this and why it's yeah. better, they're going to, they're going to believe you. You know, kids are hardwired to, to emulate their parents and to, and to learn from their parents, especially early on. Um, because you know, all mammals are like that, you know, this is like you know, baby cheaters are just studying their mom on how to hunt and not what to do because their parent have by definition, um, you know, won the game of life and, uh, have, have procreated. And so they've, they've been able to do something, uh, and, and procreate successively. And so, you know, obviously we know that, that they did it right. Um, so your mammal kids are just going to be studying their parents. And so if you, if you, you teach them and, and, uh, and tell them all these sorts of things, it's going to be really hardwired in there, which is also why, you know, it really sucks when, when people are pushing vegetables and, and giving them processed food, because it's just going to be really ingrained in there. And it's going to be a lot harder, uh, to break that, you know? Um, but yeah. And I think that, I think at the end of the day, people, parents don't really actually care, you know, what, what you want to do with it. I mean, there's always going to be, you know, nosy neighbor that just be like, oh my God, she does what, you know, but like, who cares, you know? And um, I've always found that like, the less I talk about what I do, the less I, I talk about it and less people notice it. And it just, it just happens. And, you know, when I first did this in my early twenties, 
I never, I never thought about it. I wasn't like doing something different. I was just like, yeah, I don't, I don't even plants. Plants are trying to kill you. Just don't touch them. And I would just eat the meat and just do whatever. No one ever said a thing, ever said a thing, just never. And, uh, and that's because I just never thought about it. I was never self-conscious about it because I just, I just didn't even think of it as being something different. And when you do think of it as something different, you start thinking like, oh, people are going to notice. What are they going to think? Then people just look at you and be like, hmm, what's different over here? Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that once you just sort of just stop caring, everybody else stops caring too. Yeah. yeah. I, I've had time periods where I don't say that much about it and nobody seems to care. I also, right now I'm looking out my window at my minivan, which in massive letters across the back, the entire back glass of my minivan says, eat the meat, save the humans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then there's me now, but I even find now, like there's a neighbor across the street. We just move in here and here I've got this van, eat the meat, save the humans. And the guy said, he's an older guy and he's like, so uh, what's that about? <laughs> and I told him a little bit. He said, you know what? My knee has been killing me. And the doctor said I need to lose 50 pounds. So I don't know. Maybe I'll try that. I said, like, okay. Yeah. You know, people sometimes are just curious. So I try yeah. to also, in my own mindset, expect that people may have questions. And that's okay. As mm-hmm. long as nobody's being you know, rude or degrading. And I really, yeah. other than like on TikTok, haven't experienced that myself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> TikTok is rude and degrading. And so, but yeah. in real life, most people are just genuinely curious. Yeah, I think so. And, and also they, they just, they actually want to know because, you know, people do care about their health and they, and they care about what's right. You know, people are so dismissive, <clears throat> you know, they say that it's like, oh, well, you know, people, people need to be led along by the nose because they just don't know what's good for them. They just don't care. And they just, you know, they don't, they don't, maybe don't have the ability to, it's, um, it's very condescending and it's absolutely mm-hmm. not true. You know, people work very hard uh, most of the time to, to do what's right, you know, and, and, they're, and they're trying to do what's right. And they're trying to do what's right for themselves. They're trying to do what's right for their children. They're trying to do the best thing that they can uh, for their kids and their health. And it's just that they've, they've been told the wrong thing and they've been told it over and over and over again. Uh, but people do care. And, and so I, I find the same thing. People, you know, get genuinely curious and they see that I, you know, have good results with it with my health and and then fitness. And so, and they just go be like, Hmm, okay, well, you know, maybe there's something to this. Like I was, um, <clears throat> I was working with, uh, in orthopedics, um, on a rotation, uh, some years back. And, um, I had some, some friends who were orthopedists and they were like, Oh, you know, did you know this person? I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah. So we were just, you know, talking and, you know, making, because we had mutual friends and, uh, and so we were operating together, uh, for a number of weeks and, um, you know, they, they all started becoming much more interested in, my, my diet and my carnivore diet. And uh, they started, they all started doing it themselves and they all started getting really interested. And so I had this, this whole like group of uh, orthopedic surgeons that were all in this practice that were just like, you know, just, just wanted to like know more and, 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 and talk about it. And they were all trying it. And, um, and I was speaking to uh, a buddy of mine who, who was our mutual friend. And he was saying that like, oh yeah, you know, they, they were talking to me about it. You know, they, you know, um, they were really interested in, in the carnivore thing. And, uh, and, and they said that they were like, yeah, you know, he talks about, you know, just, just eating meat and you're just kind of thinking like, mm, you know, is that really right? But then, you know, we're, we're getting changed into scrubs and he takes his shirt off and you're like, okay, yeah. All right. Yeah. Maybe there's something to this, you know? Right. And, like, and they were like, you were like, yeah, like, he was like, that guy's jacked. And uh, my buddy was just like, yeah, well, you know, because, you know, we played rugby together in, in uh, medical school. And, um, and he was just like, he's like, yeah, well, uh, uh, Chafee's always been jacked, but now he's really jacked. And, um, and so he's like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe there's something to that. And he's like, yeah, maybe, maybe there is. And, um, you know, and, and so, you know, people see this and they see people like yourself, um, you know, have, have excellent results and they see you raising your kids and they're very healthy and happy. Um, and exactly, they're just going to be curious. And that's why I think this is, this is slowly but surely growing. I mean, I'm certainly when you first started doing this in, in, uh, you know, 2007, eight, nine, whatever, um, obviously there just, you know, weren't as many people, there were people in that group, but there weren't as many groups and, and yeah. And, uh, I think it's, it's grown, you know, just in the last sort of five years that I've been paying attention, I think it's grown significantly. What, you know, have you noticed the same thing? Dude, we were doing our thing. The group was slowly growing and we had all these journals and then we moved over to Facebook. All was well, people trickling in at a nice pace. And then 
Dr. Sean Baker. Mm -hmm. Boom. That yeah. was when it was like, and they stopped saying, we had all still been saying zero carb. We do zero yeah. carb, zero carb. And he's like, carnivore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Explosion. That it was, it was not just noticeable. It was like, dee, 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 boom. All of a sudden, yeah. so many carnivores coming in. It, it did make a big difference. Yeah, I think that, I think you know, getting the exposure that he had on Joe Rogan, especially. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> Joe Rogan has has such such great reach, and um, you know, and and just having you know someone like like Dr. Baker on there, who's who's a very smart, articulate man, and he 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 really really does make an effort to just go through the data and the research. And so the guy, you know, is, is you know has this encyclopedic sort of memory, and he's just just banging off stats and statistics and and uh, you know research and analysis, you know that that I think did a very very good job uh, in in promoting that. And then you had you know 120 million downloads a month that Joe Rogan gets. Yes. You know you're going to start getting some traction, which is which is really really good uh, good to see. Yes, yeah. I have a very quick little brag story right here, but it's mm. sort of funny. I was in my basement at my old house and a friend of mine named Rachel from school, she sent me a text and said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, my husband was listening to Joe Rogan and they just said your name. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not sure. I didn't know who Joe Rogan was. Yeah. <laughs> so in that moment, I, I really didn't. Uh, that's been a while since yeah. Sean, Dr. Baker went on that episode, but then I went back and listened. I was like, Oh my gosh, what did they say? Quote, it was Dr. Baker. He said, and then you got Kelly Hogan. She was a really, really big woman. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, <laughs> and I was like, uh huh. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Where does he go from there? No, it was good. Yeah. Hey, so you're about to run out of time. You want to join mm -hmm. this real quickly and then we can wrap up, rejoin yeah. this room. Okay. Yeah. Let me do that. I'll go over to Instagram and click it again. Okay. So my friend Rachel texted and said, they just said your name on Joe Rogan. And I did not know who that was. And when I did find out and I listened and Dr. Baker was calling me a really big woman, I'm like, I'm not sure how I feel about this, but <laughs> then it turned out that was like the podcast. Yeah. That was the one that was the big one, man, where everybody started showing up and I ended up being like, that's right. I was on the Joe Rogan show. I mean, I wasn't there, but they said it. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm really proud of that, that I get, even got to be like mentioned by those two, because that was an amazing episode. Yeah, no, it really was. You know, that, that was that was sort of my, um, you know, revitalization into into this as well. And, and what really helped me see, you know, what the hell I'd been doing 20 years earlier, you know, because I was I was only eating meat, you know, but I was doing it because I wasn't eating plants because I knew mm. plants were trying to kill me and well, insofar as we were, I was trying to kill them by eating them, you know, and they were just like, I'll get you back, buddy. And, um, and so I just stopped doing that. And then, but then I slipped off because I didn't, I didn't really know how significant it was what I was doing. I didn't know how big of a deal, a deal it was. And then, you know, watching Dr. Baker, it was just like, you know, I was looking at that and I was listening to the things that he was saying. I was just like, crap, like this, this guy's more right than he knows because like, there was a lot of things that I, had had learned you know with with you know the plants and their toxins um you know cholesterol actually not being a uh, cause of heart disease um fructose being you know abhorrent and uh you know and and, and many other things that was just like you know this 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 is this is bang on and so you know I, that's when i really started digging into the research myself and that you know i contacted dr baker a couple months after that uh when i was pretty satisfied you know that i had a, a, a handle on the on the literature and just sort of like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, this is who I am. This is my background. And, you know, we, we both came from a, you know, a professional rugby background, which is really cool. We were both doctors and it, you know, it was interesting. And we both sort of came at, came at this from different angles. And, uh, and I was just like, hey, you know, if you want to like talk sometime and, you know, just compare notes and, and whatever, he's just like, yeah, you know, do you want to, do you want to do that on my podcast? I was like, sure. Yeah. It yes. sounds good. And um, yeah. And so that was, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, and, I'm, and in fact, I'll, I'll be uh, having him on, on my show uh, coming up too, which is really cool. So it's sort of come around full circle, you know? Yeah. And that um, is really cool. yeah, it is. And, uh, but yeah, I, I think I, I'm, a, I'm such a big fan of, of Dr. Baker. I just like, I like him personally. I, I just think he's a cool ass dude. And, um, and I, I don't know, I've always gotten along with orthopedic surgeons more than anyone, you know, in, oh. uh, professionally. Well, you know, I, I get along with, with everyone at work and I, you know, I really enjoy what I do and obviously whatever, 
uh, team I'm on, you know, I, I, I generally have an affinity with them because, you know, they're my teammates and um, I've always been a team sport person and a team player. And, um, but, you know, a lot of orthopedic surgeons, you know, have a sports background, you know, a lot of them do a lot of athletes who then go into medicine, you know, a lot of them just gravitate to orthopedics. Some of them, that's their inspiration because they have an orthopedic surgeon that helped them through an injury. And they're like, yeah, this is really cool. You know, I like that. And, you know, so, you know, I, I like orthopedics, but like, I love neurosurgery and, but it's always a blast operating with orthopedic guys because it's just cool. It's like, it's like a locker room, you know, at the rugby team, you're just, (laughs) just talking and shooting the shit and just having fun. And it's, you know, it, it is a lot of fun. And, um, you know, and, uh, and obviously, you know, Dr. Baker is, uh, is just, you know, just a nice guy and he's, he's very, very well versed in this and he works very hard to, uh, to, to get more so. And so I think that, that he's just, he's done a, a great job, uh, for this movement and for, and getting people their health back. And so I'm just, yeah, I think that, um, you know, what he's doing like with Rivera health as well is, is very interesting too, because I, I really think that you know, the, the, the entire paradigm of medicine really does need to shift. And instead of going to disease management, really going to prevention. And, uh, and, and so that that's, I'm totally on board with that. And, you know, full disclosure, I, I was so on board with that I invested in, in the company as well. So I'm not, I'm not just trying to pitch a commercial for my investment, but, you know, I, I really do believe in it. And that's why I did invest because I think that that's exactly what we need to do with healthcare and that people like myself and, and Dr. Baker, we need to put our money where our mouth is. And just be like, I think this is the right thing to do. And, and so I'm going to try to do it. And so that's what I did. Um, but you mentioned, you mentioned at the beginning uh, that you were doing classes on uh, getting rid of, of processed food addiction, um, which I think is, is very important. You know, like we we're talking about with, you know, with kids, you know, getting, you know, eating bananas and eating, you know, processed garbage and having, you know, having their brains on fire. You know, this is something that can be very difficult uh, especially when, you know, maybe, maybe a, a parent or an adult is able to you know, have a come to Jesus moment and go like, I need to get my life straight. Uh, but oftentimes it's very, very difficult as well. But, you know, even, even for kids and they're trying to get their kids healthy as well. And their kids absolutely don't want to do that because they're very addicted. They're the picky eaters that are, uh, addicted to this food. Um, what are, what are some of the things, uh, that you guys are learning? What are, what are you doing? And yeah, just, just tell us more about that. Cause that's very interesting. Thanks. Okay. So if anybody has listened to you and I talk for this long and they're already totally carnivore, mm-hmm. they may not need to know this unless they're trying to help somebody in their family or friends that are, you know, in trouble. Mm-hmm. However, I have learned in my coaching that it is not just as simple as saying, you know what, you should just stop eating processed foods. And people don't say, oh, okay, no more than going to AA and saying, you know what y'all's problem is, you should stop having alcohol. Oh, okay. (laughs) It just doesn't work that way. So in these classes, um, and and I am really new to this, I'm fascinated by the addiction side of it. So I did take down some notes. I would say, first of all, just people need to be really honest with themselves about what the problem is. If there are online um, quizzes, Dr. Ifland has a quiz about whether how to determine that it's actually an addiction. And there are uh, many factors that I checked off for myself how I used to be all of them. And one of the biggest ones to me is you understand that it is affecting you mentally and or phys- physically in negative ways, but you still can't step away from it. Okay. Now we're dealing with an addiction. That's just one of the pretty big clues. Um, learning the history of processed foods and how they're connected with the big tobacco companies that took over and really purposefully tried to make these substances as addictive as possible. I think people need to Mm. know that. Learn the science behind addiction and the reasons that some foods are almost impossible for anybody to moderate in the same way that you wouldn't expect people to be moderate smokers, right? That's not what they were designed to be. And people need to understand that in order to release some of this self-blame and self-shame, we need to give our mirror neurons in our brains our mirror neurons want to mirror what is around us and if all we are surrounded with are pharmaceutical company commercials and fast food commercials and unhealthy people that's what our brains emulate we are tribal people and so we need to give our brains something healthy to mirror so whether it's joining a carnivore group going on carnivore instagram accounts watching carnivore 
YouTube videos like this, <laughs> have some interactions with the people who are what you want to become. Yeah. Um, remove the foods that trigger the obsessive eating, the binging, the health problems and cravings. Get it out of the house and out of your life. Stay full and satisfied on nutrient dense foods like animal products. If you are very full, it's going to be so much easier to resist this garbage food, especially if it's not in your house. Prepare yourself for success. That's part of that. Just get out the bad stuff, stock up on meat. Um, then here's a piece that I think is missing a lot that I'm trying to work with with my group members a lot. Um, filling up your brain and your life with other coping techniques because people use food their whole lives, sugar and processed foods to cope. So whether it's controlled breathing exercises, some visualization, meditation, taking walks, affirmations, hobbies, prayer, talking to a friend, there are so many ways to get the, what we're getting from these processed foods is hits of dopamine and oxytocin and um, endorphins and serotonin. And it makes us feel like, yeah. So when you're having a bad day and we start downing ice cream, suddenly you feel better because you get that lizard brain as Dr. Ifflin calls it, which is like our primal hit of all this stuff that makes us go, yeah, I need more of that. I need more, <sighs> I feel better. And so that work stress is suddenly gone and it works for like a little bit until, you know, then you realize, oh, okay, work is still there. So there are other ways to get those happy endorphins like laughter, touch, exercise, dance, cold showers, acupuncture. There's so many ways to get those hits that don't involve processed foods. Um, eating while we are in a really calm state, calming our brain down and being mindful of this is a meal. I'm not grazing all day. I'm going to sit down to a meal of nutrient dense foods and turn off the phone and just eat can be a really good way for people to calm their brains and just focus. Um, keeping our limbic system calm from just totally abstaining from the trigger foods. If you have um, somebody has dealt with a lot of trauma, sometimes they are eating processed foods to help cope with that. And so there is a lady named Byron Katie, a therapist and author. She does something called the work, either getting a therapist or working through some of these past issues without the food. It can be very hard. Um, I work with 150 people per week. And one of the most common things they say is I don't know how to deal with sadness, loneliness, stress and grief without doing it in the way I've done it my whole life. And that is going to processed foods and sugar and carbs in the freezer or the fridge. People don't know. So they're, you know, you have to literally learn how to handle that. Um, continually remind yourself why, why are you doing this? What are we trying to avoid? Is it my, my grandmothers all had dementia and Alzheimer's. I don't want that. I had boils. I was obese. So every day it's a choice of choosing these foods that did that to me or the life I really want and food that also tastes amazing. Um, and so strongly associating all of the pains that we've had in the past, associating those boils with those foods, associating the cravings I used to have with the diet soda. Uh, so you take on, Dr. Flind always says like, take the group member or the client or whoever it is, take them to that pain mm -hmm. and have them reflect on what exactly it was that caused it. And it takes the comfort out of those comfort foods. And so then we have to comfort ourselves in other ways. And then just learn to fill your life with other hobbies and things that aren't, um, and again, if somebody is totally carnivore and you're free from this, and maybe this was never even your addiction, it may sound crazy, but for so many people, our whole lives as children was just about comforting ourselves with these foods. And it's like ripping away somebody's security blanket. Mm -hmm. And so as a coach, it's, it's really important for me to not just say, okay, eat meat, very important step, <laughs> but then like, okay, how does our, your whole life may change? when you break an addiction to something. And so learning other ways to replace that, um, I have seen be really useful to people. Just having a tribe also, have somebody in your corner who's doing the same thing and pulling for you. So that, that's what I'm learning about is just the addiction side. And I'm really excited about it, uh, obviously, because you and I, I think somebody, it just took us like, oh, so I feel better on meat. And my doctor said, eat meat. so. That's what we'll do and that here we are. Um, but also I'm not um, an alcoholic. So if somebody were to say, you know, alcohol is bad. Okay, no big deal. It's easy for some people to drop some things. This is a really hard addiction for some people to break. 
And I want this, what you and I feel, I want it so badly for other people that I just want to delve in and get to the heart of how, how can they get off of this? It's killing them, literally killing them. And like you said earlier, humans, we do not want to be in pain. We don't want to die and we don't want to hurt our children. That's the literal opposite of what every human wants. <laughs> so just giving them the tools, the knowledge first, and then the tools on how to do that. That's, that's where my head is these days. Awesome. And, um, well, you know, and I think that's, that's, you know, uh, so important to be able to address that because, you know, a lot of people, you know, really do want to get healthy, but they, they are just addictive. I, I and they just stuck on these things. Artificial sweeteners are, are an absolute beast to get off. Um, you know, I, I, I talked to a lot of people and, and you know, they, they come into it thinking, well, artificial sweeteners, it's no carbs. So it's not actually food. It's just, it's just a sweet taste. So it can't be that bad. But my God, is it ever? And and you know, I've, I've had a couple of people that I've been, you know, talking to and just trying to help out, um, you know, uh, just just because. And like, you know, they were saying that that getting rid of the artificial sweeteners has been has been the hardest part, yes. and they they haven't been able to. They're just sort of yo-yoing just with the the uh, artificial sweeteners. Um, you know, one gentleman I've been trying to help out, he, you know, has 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 basically gone you know, straight carnivore pretty early on, he, he, you know, really jumped into it, you know, head first, but, you know, he was still having some energy drinks and some artificial sweetener, you know, sweetened drinks or, or, or supplements. And, and he was saying, he's just, he just can't, can't kick it. I think he's saying, you know, he's, he, that he's gone, you know, full carnivore that gotten rid of the artificial sweeteners. You know, he just said that he, he got rid of it. Now he's been, you know, 24 hours, artificial sweetener free. I think he's probably, you know, I don't know, the fourth or fifth time he said that. And I was like, wait, you're still eating that crap? And I was just like, I thought you stopped like months ago. But, you know, it's very hard, you know. And, um, you know, so being able to address this with, with, with those techniques, I think, is, is really important. Um, you, you work, obviously, w- with clients as well. You, I think you mentioned um, to, to me off air that you work with some 150 clients a week. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So it's a month long coaching. Many people do sign up, you know, stay in for more than a month just because a lot of them, even once they're off of these products, it's just, you know, a fun community support place to Mm. to come each week. But there are five small groups. It's not 150 in one. I think um, the relationship piece is really important. Trusting the person who you are mirroring your mirror, sorry, mirror neurons uh, work best when it's when you feel loved and supported. Mm -hmm. And, and it makes you want, like you're saying with the, the mammals and their parents, right? It, it's, a, it's a loving and supportive parent. And it's, you know, so much easier to emulate what they're doing if it's healthy. Yeah. And, and is this over, over the, do you guys do like Zoom meetings and talk? Or do you have like, uh, like text groups or, or how, do you, how do you do your coaching? So we do have um, private, it's 30 people in each group. So mm-hmm. they only see their other 29 people in the group plus me. And so we do Zooms each week. And then also there's a private Facebook group where they post meals or questions, or they come in and say, oh my gosh, today is hard. It's day four without diet soda. Talk to me. And that, you know, people jump in. There are some people who are really experienced like years in on carnivore. And it's so good to have those people around. Cause again, you're emulating what is working for someone else versus having a whole group of just beginners. Mm. Um, I did start off that way. I was like, and this is our beginner class. And like, oh my gosh, they're all struggling. And you're just looking around at other people struggling. And so then it's like, you know, yeah. the drama festers sort of, whereas somebody steps in and says, yep, that was me a month ago. I remember. And by day five, without that diet soda, it will start to release and you're going to feel better. You know, that calming voice of I've been there, that mm. empathy, it really does matter for people. Yeah. And so is this a carnivore group for each group of 30 or is that for, for everyone who's done your class as well? So each group of 30 has their own, that's their cohort. They meet mm-hmm. via Zoom, only those 30 people, and they mm-hmm. can only those people see that Facebook group. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. And oh, then I cool. have five of those groups. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's really fun. And, and you know, what, what sort of results are you, are you getting from people? What, what, what are you seeing? 
It's good, man. It's so good because I feel like it takes what, what I've been saying on Facebook for so long. Like, you know, if you can just quit eating sugar and start eating meat, things that we say all the time, mm. but it's just, it is enough for plenty of people. Go over to Facebook carnivore groups. It is enough for a lot of people. Yeah. However, you also will see people there who try and fail and try and try. And it's just a really hard addiction and they just need a little something else. And yeah. so learning all of these techniques and, and having that support, it, it really can make a difference. Yeah, no, I'm sure, I'm sure you can. And, you know, a lot of people uh, have, have expressed exactly that to me that, you know, are there, are there other people around me, you know, because, you know, it's, it's hard to just be the only one doing this mm -hmm. and having everyone look at you like you're a crazy person and you're going to, you're going to kill yourself with this diet. And, uh, and so I, that's exactly what I, I recommend to people is, you know, try to get involved with an online community, uh, joining these Facebook groups, and then you can, you know, you can, you can talk to other people and you can get support and you can have that, that sense of community. Because, you know, like, like you said, you know, we are, uh, you know, tribal creatures, we are pack animals, if we, we need our troop, we need our tribe. And, you know, it, it's very lonely out there when it's, yes. uh, when it's just you against the world, there's some people that can do it. I've, I've had to do that at, uh, at different times in my life. And, you know, I, I travel around Europe when, you know, most people in Europe love to talk trash about Americans and I do not like people talking trash about Americans. And, and I, you know, so I would defend it. It was not like I'd be getting fist fights or anything, yeah. but, you know, a lot of people will travel to Europe and, and from America and just, and just, just take everything, every slur that comes their way about America, about how horrible and racist and this, and it's just like, like no that's that's really not what it's like and but but people just be oh yeah no it's really bad oh gosh because they just want to have a nice time they don't want it yeah. they just want to get along they're there for two weeks or they're there for uh a a, a study abroad program they just they just want to have a nice time and so they'll just go along with it and i've just never been that person i've never i've never i've never i've never, I never go along to get along and and so people say oh yeah americans are ignorant americans it's like oh really are we okay why go and they'd be like, huh. well, you know, they'd be very taken aback. But I would, I would debate people daily, you know, about like, you know, because they'd have something to say about Americans. And I'd, I'd, I'd say like, all right, put it up. What are you basing that on? You know? And, um, you know, so I've, I've had to be that sort of, you know, lone wolf sort of behind enemy lines for most of my adult life. But that's not, that's not really a comfortable for, position for most people to be in. And so it's, you know, you need that sense of community. And obviously I really like, I prefer that as well. That's why I've always loved rugby because it is such a, a family community uh, sort of sport. You know, you, you people on your team, you, you train together, you play together, you party together, you go out together, you travel together. You know, it really becomes, uh, you, know, you know, they become family to you. And, um, you know, so that, that's something that I, I enjoy just as much, you know, much more than, than not. But um uh, it's when you're doing something like this, it, it can, it can definitely help. So I, I think that's great that you you're growing those communities and, and getting people. And I'm sure that, you know, after these groups, they, they probably stay, you know, quite close and, you know, and help each other along the way as well. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, some of them, we go to meetups this coming oh, yeah. July. I'm nice. going to, I've heard that you could be there, New Jersey. Are you thinking about New Jersey? Karen, I think Karen Miles said she talked to you or maybe she just invited you. Um, Dr. Lisa Wiedemann is hosting the Northeast meetup in New Jersey this July. I went last year and this mm. year, a ton of my like online group members are coming. Mm. And last year, I remember just the idea of, you know, you've spent so much time with them online, face to face like this. You feel mm -hmm. like you know a person because you do know yeah. a person. And yeah. then you get to really hug their necks and sit down and eat a steak together. It's... It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm so pumped for July. When in July is that? I think it's July 17th, but Dr. Lisa Wiedemann would be the person. She is mm -hmm. carnivore doctor on mm -hmm. Instagram. Yeah. Uh, then she has, she's the one selling tickets for it right now. Last year was the best meetup I've ever been to. It was big. The food was fabulous. It was great. Awesome. I'll, I'll yeah. have to check. I, I will be back in the States uh, in early July for KetoCon in, in Austin. Yeah, I think it's the very next weekend. Okay. Oh, mm. let's see. So it may be too let's close. See. Well, it might That's be. That's why I'm not going to be at KetoCon. back the next weekend is the problem. Oh, it's July 16th, the following Saturday. But mm. 
whoever wants to come, they should look it up. It is a great time. In fact, I really did want to go to KetoCon, but they had already scheduled this for the next weekend and I couldn't do, you know, Can kids. You I wasn't going to do two back to back, but uh, I, I'm going to New Jersey. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I would, I would love to go. I think that I, I will probably have to be flying back that weekend, so I may not be able to make it. Um, not if it's on the Saturday. Well, if I can, I will. I'd love to. I, you know, I, I absolutely would love to go. To, I you know, would love to go to the, those sorts of things because, like, like you say, you know, it's just really nice to meet people in person, and you and you do you know get to know people uh, through interactions like this and and online and, and talking to people. And, but then actually just meeting them in person is, yeah, it's just, it's very nice to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, I, I, I I've realized that we've, we've been talking for quite some time. We've been cut off on zoom twice already. And so um, thank you so much um, for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. It's always really lovely to talk to you. Um, and it's, it's just, it's just been a pleasure. So thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Keep doing what you're doing. It's yeah. you're you're rocking it out, man. Really yeah. changing lives. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's, it's sort of um, nice to, to have things positively received. I just, you know, I, I didn't know um, if people would like it, but um, you know, if, if they do, I'm glad they do. And I, and just, yeah, just hopefully it helps people. That's the main thing. Yes. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, cool. Man. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll see you soon.